Good evening, my dear friends and colleagues. Today we will talk about one of the uh, hot topics in nephrology, which is uh, lupus nephritis. Lupus nephritis uh, is very common, uh, usually complicated disease, and needs uh, a high level of experience to deal with uh, lupus nephritis cases. So we will discuss it in two parts, uh, inshallah, in details to help you in your uh, management. This is our agenda in, in part one. In part two, we'll discuss treatment uh, in full details according to the Kidigo guidelines. Lupus nephritis, as we all uh, know, is an immune complex, immune complex disease or uh, is considered one, uh, one of the autoimmune disorders. What is meant by autoimmune disorders? It means that uh, the body or the immune system will form antibodies against our self antigens in normal population our immune system usually don't uh, attack his own tissues but in autoimmune disorders there is auto antibodies against our self antigens and lupus nephritis is considered one of the most common prototypes for immune complex glomerulonephritis lupus nephritis is common and serious and serious as we going to see systemic lupus is defined by two criteria most of the rheumatological diseases are very clear uh, when i am suspecting a, a patient or, or i am facing a patient uh, and i suspect lupus or rheumatoid arthritis or ankylosing spondylitis i should follow the criteria for diagnosis so any patient or uh, coming to me uh, complaining of joint pain, malar rash, uh, alopecia, uh, there is frothy urine, edema, and you suspect lupus, I should follow the criteria first to diagnose lupus. So what are the criteria for diagnosing lupus, systemic lupus as a whole? We have two criteria. The old one is the American College of Rheumatology or the ACR criteria published in 1997. And the recent one, which is the SLEC criteria, SLEC for Systemic Lupus International Collaborating Clinics, published in uh, 2012. SLEC criteria you, uh, have, uh, has a greater sensitivity and fewer misclassifications uh, compared to the ACR criteria. So we have ACR, and select criteria. We should know each one of them, very important. For the ACR, to diagnose lupus, I need, I need four or more criteria from the following criteria. We have 11 criteria. I need to diagnose lupus, I need four or more, four or more. What are the criteria in the ACR criteria? Uh, ACR uh, criteria for lupus, malar rash, discoid rash, photosensitivity, oral nasopharyngeal ulcers, arthritis, uh, uh, serositis in the form of pleuritis or uh, pleurisy or pericarditis, renal disease, and I'm going to discuss it, neurological manifestations, hematological or immunological disorders in the form of uh, positive anti double strand DNA, anti SMAS antiphospholipid uh, antiphospholipid antibodies including lupus anticoagulant uh, and positive anticardiolipin and positive antinuclear or ana these are the 11 criteria to diagnose a patient to have nephritis or kidney affection in lupus the ACR defined renal disease as having proteinuria more than 500 mg per day or 3 plus three plus proteins on dipstick or having cellular cost. So to, to, uh, the kidney affection or nephritis is defined by having protein or more than 0.5 gram per day or three plus proteins in dipstick or cellular cost. This is the ACR. What about the SLIC criteria? According to SLIC criteria to diagnose lupus, also I need four, four or more criteria, but here, they uh, divided the criteria into clinical criteria and immunological criteria and to diagnose i need as i said four or more but i should have at least one clinical and one immuno immunological criteria so to diagnose uh, as we said we have we need to have four or more criteria 
but there should be at least one clinical and one immunological criteria. Usually, uh, uh, mostly it is similar to the ECR criteria with some exceptions that are modified uh, by removing photosensitivity to acute cutaneous lupus or chronic cutaneous uh, lupus. Uh, to clarify how the uh, kidney involvement is so important in lupus patient, we can, there is an exception to diagnose lupus by only having proof, biopsy proven lupus nephritis, lupus nephritis that is confirmed by renal biopsy with either positive anti-nuclear antibody or anti double strand. So the exception to diagnose lupus we can, uh, we can diagnose lupus without having the four criteria. We need just two criteria, lupus nephritis by renal biopsy with positive ana or anti double strand to clarify how the kidney is so important in lupus patient. And slick criteria define a, a kidney involvement in, a loop, uh, in, loop, in systemic lupus by either having red, red blood cell cost or proteinuria more than 0.5 gram on 24-hour urinary protein or proteinuria or protein, uh, in protein to creatine ratio more than 0.5, okay. measured according to uh, equaling 0.5 gram per day. So red cell cost, proteinuria in 24-hour protein or PCR to have proteinuria more than 0.5 gram per day. This is how to diagnose lupus when I am suspecting. Kidney involvement is, in lupus is very common. It will occur in about 50%. 50% of lupus patients will have nephritis at one time. So it is very common. The peak incidence for lupus uh, as a whole is between 15 and 45 years of age with a female to male ratio 9, 9 to 1. Usually we said it is 9 to 1, the female to male ratio. But this female predominance is less pronounced or less clear in children and older individuals. What about the lupus nephritis? We talk about the lupus, systemic lupus as a whole, but what about the lupus nephritis? Lupus nephritis affects both sexes equally. It affects male and the female equally. And usually lupus nephritis is more severe in children and men. So in children and men, usually the disease is more severe uh, rather than in older individuals. The incidence of lupus nephritis is variable according to the uh, race and ethnicity. It is highest in plaques and Asian population usually have a higher prevalence of lupus nephritis. And black and Hispanic patients usually have lupus nephritis earlier and more severe with worse outcomes. This is very important. These, are, uh, these uh, ethnicities usually have a higher risk for uh, severe forms of lupus nephritis. So again, lupus nephritis affects both sex equally, more severe in children and men, higher incidence uh, in black population. Black and Hispanic patients usually develop lupus nephritis earlier with worse outcomes. It's very important for clinical practice and for the exam. What about the complications or the end-stage renal disease probability? Approximately about 10% of patients with lupus nephritis will develop end-stage renal disease. So about 10% will reach end-stage renal disease, and this percentage increase according to the histological class. As we are going to say, in class 4, class 3, and class 4 are uh, the most have uh, the most worse outcomes, and the percentage of reaching in the stage genetic disease will reach up to high up to 45% in class 4. To clarify more and more the importance of kidney involvement in systemic lupus, what about the mortality? Mortality in patient with lupus nephritis. Patient with lupus nephritis usually die earlier than those without nephritis. So lupus nephritis have a higher rate of mortality, approaching mortality ratio of 6, 6 to 7 versus 2.4 in patients having lupus without renal involvement. 
So with lupus nephritis, the mortality ratio is very high compared to other lupus patients who don't have nephritis. So this to clarify that it's very dangerous condition. This increases to 14, this mortality ratio in 14, if the patient start to develop chronic kidney disease and 63 for those reaching in the stage renal disease. And to clarify how it is important to induce the patient to reach a remission, if patient with lupus nephritis achieved remission, the 10 year survival doubles to 95%. So it's very important to induce remission in patients with lupus nephritis and patients who don't develop remission or become resistant have a very high risk for mortality. Is there a genetic uh, element in the pathogenesis of systemic lupus? Yes, there is disease clustering and increasing number of cases in families with lupus nephritis also increase incidence between uh, concordance and there is racial di differences which increasing the possibility of genetic predisposition for lupus. Also, there is increased, increased risk for to develop lupus in patients with uh, homozygous deficiency of uh, C1Q deficiency or uh, complement 2 and complement 4. So, patient with complement uh, uh, deficiencies like C1Q, C2, and C4 has a higher risk for uh, uh, development of lupus. Also, certain polymorphisms have increasing risk, like FC gamma receptor 3 receptor polymorphism. This is also important to know. These genetic risk factors or genetic susceptibility is are lowest in Europeans. As we said before, it is higher in Asians and the highest in African African population or African ancestry. So uh, till now, patients with African ancestry or plaques have to de will develop lupus nephritis earlier, more severe, and more genetic predisposition. Also, HLA genes are strongly associated with lupus risk, especially for the HLA DR, DR family. We have four DR allele families that increase susceptibility or resistance for lupus nephritis. Also, there are uh, other polymorphisms, especially the Apple one in Plex. So it's again an, an, an specific character, uh, characteristics in black population, specific criteria to have Apple one, Apple one polymorphism, which will confer a more worse prognosis for lupus nephritis. Also, environmental factors have a role in, uh, in systemic lupus. These environmental factors include an ultraviolet exposure. So in most patients with lupus, we usually describe sunscreens to avoid uh, light uh, ultraviolet exposure. Also, smoking is a, a risk factor or will increase the risk for uh, uh, relapses. Also, viral infections may be triggers for uh, systemic lupus. Certain drugs can induce lupus as uh, known and drug-induced lupus, especially brokinamide, hydralazine, kinidine, and anti-TNF biological therapies. Now we will discuss the autoimmunity. As we said, it is the main, the main mechanism for the pathogenesis of uh, lupus nephritis. It is an autoimmune disorder. With the development of autoantibodies, the immune system will form autoantibodies against self antigens, especially nuclear proteins. Uh, how this happens? When there is apoptosis and degradation of cells, the clearance, the clearance of this apoptotic cells is impaired with the release of the nuclear autoantigens. So the nuclear antigens are released and then autoantibodies will be directed against them. The antigen presenting cells will facilitate this process with the differentiation of autoreactive B cells into plasma cells, which will form autoantibodies against these nuclear antigens, especially as we know, an anti nuclear antibody, anti double stranded DNA. All of these are uh, examples for the autoantibodies formed in lupus. 
What about lupus nephritis, especially the pathogenesis of lupus nephritis? As we said, autoantibodies are very crucial in the pathogenesis of lupus nephritis, and it is the hallmark, the hallmark of lupus nephritis is the accumulation of these immune complexes in the, in the glomeruli. These immune complexes, antigen antibody complexes, are usually deposits, are usually deposited in the glomeruli. The antidouble strand DNA will bind to the glomerular basement membrane and they cross link with the positively charged nucleosome component and with the glomerular basement membrane. So, again, this immune complex will be deposited in the glomerular basement membrane. The localization of these immune complexes will depend on what? The localization either in the subendothelial space or in the subepithelial. Uh, space uh, is usually influenced by the size of the immune complex, the charge of the immune complex, and the specificity and the avidity of the antigen and antibody, their, their uh, link between them. So the, the site will depend on the size and the charge mainly. So the immune complex will be deposited, the circulating immune complex will be deposited in the glomeruli. Especially these immune complexes who will be deposited in the subendothelial space, especially in the subendothelial space, causing a nephritic presentation, they are usually very severe, uh, forming uh, mainly happen in class 3 and class 4 lupus nephritis. They will activate pro inflammatory cytokines with activation of the complement pathway and release of these cytokines, which will end uh, uh, by kidney damage and intraglomerular hypertension and coagulation causing this severe nephritic presentation. What are the clinical manifestations or clinical manifestations of the kidney involvement? What are the clinical picture or the manifestations? Lupus nephritis is usually presented by proteinuria, the most important presentation nearly happened in 100% of cases, active urinary sediment with microhematuria, dysmorphic RBCs, and RBCs cost, the glomerular hematuria. More severe cases usually present by full plo nephritic, uh, nephritic syndrome, especially in proliferative glomerular nephritis class 3 and class 4, and usually in these uh, classes, severe classes, class 3 and 4, there is decline in the GFR and elevated urea and creatinine. A less frequent presentation is the tubular interstitial disease. The affection of lupus on the kidney is not just a glomerular affection, not only the glomeruli, also the tubules and the interstitium and the blood vessels are affected. So tubular interstitial affection can be in the form of renal tubular acidosis, interstitial nephritis, or uh, TMA or thrombotic microangiopathy, especially in cases with uh, overlapping antiphospholipid syndrome. So again, the main presentation is by proteinuria, hematuria, and decreased, uh, decreased renal uh, glomerular filtration rate. This is a very nice table showing the prevalence or the manifestations in lupus patient with renal involvement or the manifestations of uh, lupus uh, nephritis. As you see here, proteinuria is nearly in 100% of cases, and it is a nephrotic range proteinuria in the for nearly around 50% of cases. It's usually in the nephrotic range proteinuria more than 3.5 gram per day. Hematuria, it is my mainly microscopic in about 80% of cases, can be gross hematuria very rarely, 1 to 2 percent, and RBCs cost are present in around 10 percent of cases. Mainly, mainly, it is microscopic hematuria. There is cellular cost in around 30 percent. There is reduced renal functions ranging between 40 to 80 percent, and this reduced kidney function can be in the form of RBGN, rapidly progressive glomerular nephritis, which is common and can happen in the form of uh, representing about 10 to 20 percent of cases and AKI in 1 to 2 percent of cases. Hypertension usually present in 15 to 50 percent of cases and hyperkalemia in 15 percent. 
So the main presentations are proteinuria and hematuria plus or minus impaired kidney function and hypertension. What about the extra renal manifestations of uh, lupus nephrites? Uh, as we said, lupus is an autoimmune disease with multisystemic affection. There is non-specific manifestations like malaise, low-grade fever, poor appetite, weight loss, and usually, as we said, it is multisystemic disease, and nearly all organs of our body can be affected. Skin manifestations in the form of alopecia, oral and nasal ulcerations, arthralgia, arthritis. As we said, there is a lot of skin uh, findings, photosensitivity, renal the phenomena, Muller or butterfly facial rash. A very characteristic one is the levido reticularis, which is present in around 15% of cases. And if we found the levido reticularis, we should search for or ask for miscarriage, thrombocytopenia, and antiphospholipid syndrome. It is usually associated with antiphospholipid syndrome. CNS involvement include neuropsychiatric involvement, and the patient can present by headache, nerve pulses, psychosis, or comatose in uh, cerebritis, cirrhosis in the form of pleuritis, chest pain, and pericarditis, nearly 40% of cases, and in some cases can uh, can be uh, diagnosed as having pulmonary hypertension from repeated pulmonary emboli from antiphospholipid syndrome. Let's talk about the diagnosis. The diagram from the Kidigo 2021. If we suspecting lupus nephritis, we should ask for serum creatinine, urine analysis to search for dipstick uh, proteins and sediments, protein create ratio, and of course serology, anti double strand, and C3 and C4. If there is evidence, what we should search for, if there is evidence for abnormal proteinuria and urinary sediment, as we said, this is the definition of nephritis, definition of nephritis in the criteria in the form of proteinuria, hematuria, bird kidney function. We should search for if there is a proteins or urinary sediment. Abnormal proteins in the form of assisted by, if there is dipstick protein, two plus or more, Two plus or more at any level of specific gravity, or or one plus or more in patient who is low specific gravity in urine. So dipstick protein in uh, two plus or more in urine, or spot protein create ratio more than 500 milligram, with or without urinary sediment in the form of positive dysmorphic RBC is more than five percent, or red blood cell cost or white blood cell cost. So we should search for proteinuria and hematuria, as we said in details. And we should, uh, if there is evidence of decreased or decreasing GFR, if there is proteinuria and hematuria or white cell cost, if, if it is present, we should quantify proteins and confirm the presence of proteinuria by asking for 24-hour urinary proteins. If the 24-hour urinary proteins more than 500 milligram or more than 0.5 gram, yes, it is present, we should do biopsy. If it is not, we should repeat test again and close follow-up for the patient. Again, to repeat, and if it is high, higher than 0.5 gram, to do renal biopsy. If it is no, no further testing. If there is evidence of decreased GFR, to repeat the test again, we should confirm the test again, because if, uh, if it is persistent, we should do a re an invasive procedure, which is renal biopsy. So at any investigation, we should confirm the investigation again before taking the decision of renal biopsy. What about the immunological test we should ask for to confirm our diagnosis? The most common one, or the first one, which is usually prescribed, is the anti-nuclear antibody, or ANA. Anti-nuclear antibody are characterized by, it is highly sensitive, highly sensitive. It is present in more than 90% of cases. It is very highly sensitive, but it is not specific, not specific for lupus. So, they can be present in other rheumatological conditions. 
So an anti-nuclear antibody, highly sensitive but less specific. So if we have a patient to have positive ana, we should ask for more specific antibodies. More specific antibodies. And usually we should ask for anti-double-stranded DNA. Anti-double-stranded DNA antibodies. They are characterized by being more specific, more specific for lupus, but it is less sensitive less sensitive, present only in 75% of cases. So if we have anti-nuclear antibody negative, so most probably the patient, most probably will be will not be lupus. But if it is positive, we should confirm the diagnosis by asking for anti-double strand DNA, which is more specific, but it is less sensitive. The anti-double strand DNA are usually correlate, correlate with the activity of lupus and lupus nephritis. They are usually at a high tetra with activity and correlate, and this is important in practice, correlate with the activity. Another one is the anti-single strand DNA, anti-single strand DNA, which is present in many rheumatological diseases. And usually it doesn't relate with the course of lupus nephritis. It doesn't relate. Another, another specific antibody, which is the anti-SMIS antibodies. The anti-SMIS can help us in the diagnosis. It is highly specific, but it has a, a more lower sensitivity. It is present only in around 25 to 30% of cases. It has a very low sensitivity, but it has a very high specificity for lupus. So an anti-nuclear antibody, highly sensitive, but not specific. Again, the uh, uh, anti-double strand or anti-SMIS are more specific, but less sensitive. Another antibody can be asked for or uh, uh, required is anti-C1Q antibodies. Anti-C1Q antibodies, again, it's the common one, C1Q. It is usually associated with the activity of lupus nephritis, and it has a prognostic rule, so we can use it. What about the complement? Complement components, especially C3 and C4, are often depressed or decreased in patients with lupus, and usually both of them are decreased. Now we will talk about the pathology. Now we will talk about the pathology. To make a general rule, any patient with lupus nephritis should, should have a renal biopsy. We should do a renal biopsy for every patient with lupus nephritis. Why it is required, why renal biopsy is very important, because it is required for confirmation and diagnosis. As we said, it is in the uh, criteria for diagnosis, in the SLIC criteria, is very important for classification. As we said, classification of lupus nephritis, very important for prognosis and the management decision. And the management decision, decision. Because if there is severe classes, I can, I will augment and give high dose of immunosuppression. But in more benign classes, I will give a little immunosuppression or no immunosuppression as we're going to say. And it will be us in the prognosis. If we found a, 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 high, a high degree of interstitial fibrosis, this will limit uh, my uh, prescription for immunosuppression because the patient might not get benefit. So a renal biopsy is very important for diagnosis and the prognosis and management decision. As I said, we should do in any patient. So look for the indications of renal biopsy. The indication are the criteria for diagnosis. Proteinuria more than 0.5 gram per day, or if there is hematuria or leukocyturia, or unexplained decline in GFR. Can we have a repeat renal biopsy or a second renal biopsy if we have a patient with lupus nephritis coming to you with a biopsy since two to three years? Can we do a second renal biopsy? Yes, you can ask for a second renal biopsy when you suspect there is a change in the class present. If a patient uh, with class two or the patient enter remission, but now he presented with severe nephritic or RBGN or heavy proteinuric uh, uh, presentation, then I should ask for a, a new renal biopsy because there is, can, there is a change in the classes between uh, the classes of lupus nephritis and to, to manage or to uh, determine the management protocol.
we used for a classification of lupus nephritis what is called the ISM RPS, the ISM International Society of Nephrology and Renal Pathology Society classification for lupus nephritis. It is uh, uh, it is present since the new one uh, since 2003, and there is a revised criteria in 2018. We'll talk about later, but this table is very important. It's very important because it contains the pathology. It contains the pathology, the class, and the definition of the class, and the clinical presentation. Clinical presentation. This is very important. The most important table in our talk today. It is called. It's help us in the clinical, clinical, pathological correlation for each class. What we will find in urine and what is the clinical finding. Very important. Very important table. The first two classes. Remember that they are the benign classes. They are both mesangial in the first two classes. The first one is the minimal mesangial. And the second one is the mesangio proliferative lupus nephritis. Class one minimal mesangial, class two mesangio proliferative. What is the difference? Class one minimal mesangial by light microscopy, by light microscopy, then it is, uh, it is uh, normal glomeruli. Normal glomeruli. So we said it is minimal mesangial. But the finding will be present in the immune fluorescence. Immune fluorescence will find mesangial immune deposits. The immune deposits here will be present in the mesangium. So it's called minimal mesangium. Normal by light microscopy, but the immune deposits in by immune fluorescence. Urinary findings are usually unremarkable. And clinical findings, the patient will usually, most of the cases are asymptomatic, asymptomatic, no, no uh, complaint at all. And it has excellent renal prognosis. Excellent renal prognosis. As I said, class one and two are benign classes. Let's talk about class two. Class two is mesangio proliferative. So in light microscopy, there is mesangial proliferation. It's called mesangial hypercellularity, increase in the number of mesangial cells. And of course, by immune fluorescence, we will find the immune deposits in the mesangium. So this is the new one. There is by light microscopy, there is mesangial proliferation or mesangial hypercellularity. What is the urinary findings? We can find some hematuria, some proteinuria, and it is usually low grade, low grade proteinuria, usually in the form, or usually it is less than one gram. It is usually less than one gram. What is the clinical uh, presentation? L usually, patient usually they don't have edema or very minimal edema, normal urea and creatinine, usually normal blood pressure, and the renal prognosis is excellent renal prognosis. So, we can find with some or minimal presentations a form of mild lower limb edema. Mild lower limb edema uh, is usually the most common presentation, and we can find some hematuria, proteinuria, it's usually low grade. What about, let's go for the severe classes, the proliferative classes, class three and class four. Class three and class four, they are called proliferative classes. Class three is called focal proliferative, and class four is called diffuse proliferative. What is meant by prol proliferative? Proliferation is the endocabillary, endocabillary hypercellularity or extracabillary uh, glomerular nephritis, extracabillary hypercellularity. So it is mainly meant by endo endothelial cells of the capillaries or the endocapillary cells are high in number. So it's called endocapillary hypercellularity. This is proliferative class in class three and four. What is the difference? It is focal or diffuse. Focal, as we said in the earlier lectures, focal, we said focal when the affection is less is present in less than 50% of the whole glomeruli. Diffuse when the affection or the proliferation is present in more than 50% of the whole glomeruli present in the biopsy. So we have endocapillary hypercellularity in less than 50% of the glomeruli. And the immune deposits here are present in the subendothelial space. They are present mainly in the subendothelial and the mesangia, but mainly in the subendothelial space. The usual urinary finding uh, and the clinical presentation of 
are of nephritic presentation, nephritic in the form of microscopic hematuria and proteinuria. Usually we have here renal uh, uh, lower limb edema, hypertension can happen, and there is usually impaired kidney function with elevated urea and creatinine and decreased GFR. The classes can be subdivided more into either active or chronic. Active or chronic, so it's the term A or C. If there is active lesions, so it's called 3A, or chronic lesions 3C, or active and chronic lesions are present, so it's called 3A and C. So they can be subdivided into having active or chronic lesions. Let's talk about class 4. Class 4, as we said, it is diffuse proliferative. Proliferative is meant that endocabular hypercellularity in more than 50% of the number of the glomeruli, they can be divided into also A and C, active and chronic, and can be subdivided also into segmental or global affection. The segmental and the global term are usually referred when the affection in the specific glomerulus in each glomerulus when the affection in each glomerulus is present in less than 50 percent of that glomerulus it is segmental when it is more in present in more than 50 percent it is called global so they can be divided either into active and chronic or uh, and also for segmental or global this is the most severe class present by usually by severe nephritic microscopic hematuria and proteinuria and proteinuria can be heavy proteinuria usually it is a common a common uh, presentation to have a nephrotic range of proteinuria associated with the hypertension or impaired uh, kidney function or rbgn rapidly progressive glomerular nephritis and both class 3 and 4 especially class 4 has the worst renal outcome it is the most severe class what about class 5 and also here the, uh, in class 4, the immunoglobulins or the immune complexes are present in the subindociliary space. What about class 5? Class 5 is the membranous. membranous. And of course, in light microscopy, there is glomerular basement membrane thickening. And in immune fluorescence, the deposits are present, as we, as we know, in membranous, it is present in the sub-epithelial sub space. It is present in the sub-epithelial space. And of course, it is membranous, so the main presentation is nephrotic syndrome. Nephrotic syndrome usually in the form of high heavy uh, proteinuria or high grade proteinuria, more than 3.5 gram. Microscopic hematuria is usually less common, less common than class three and four. But the main presentation here is uh, nephrotic range proteinuria and nephrotic syndrome, and usually the renal function are intact or remain preserve it for a long time, and uh, the renal prognosis is good compared to class 3 and 4. As we say, uh, and of course, the antiplar here is negative because it is a secondary membrane. The last stage, or class 6, is the advanced sclerosing uh, stage, or advanced sclerosing class, when, when there is more than 90% of the glomeruli are globally sclerosed. It is the end stage class, when there is more than 90% sclerosed, usually present by some microscopic hematuria. Proteinuria is usually uh, present but at a lower stage. And the main presentation, of course, is deterioration of kidney function or decreased GFR for more than three months. Also, I put here the, and you should know it, the revised criteria. At, uh, published in 2018 regarding the classification of the ICM RPS. This is the recommendation. The cutoff in the uh, old one, the cutoff for mesangial hypercellularity or mesangial proliferation is not clear, so they change the term to in, instead of mesangial prolif mesangial proliferative to mesangial hypercellularity to clarify more about the number of cells and they put a definition when we can say it is hypercellularity when there is four four or more of nuclei surrounded by matrix in the mesangial area 
so we so we have here a number when we have four or more nuclei so it is hypercellularity in an area in the mesangial area in class three and four what is the recommendation they replaced the endocapillary proliferation by by endocapillary again hypercellularity so this is the new term hypercellularity endocapillary hypercellularity to to uh, clarify more it is not just proliferation of the endothelial cells but we can have an influx of the inflammatory cells so we have increased number of cells another term which become more clarified is crescent crescent was what is the definition of crescent crescent is extra capillary hypercellularity extra capillary hypercellularity composed of a mixture of cells fibrin can be present and 10 or more 10 10% or more of the circumference of bound band capsule should be involved. This is the definition of crescent. So to define a crescent, it extra capillary hypercellularity involving involving more than 10% of the circumference of bound band capsule. And also they define cellular crescent when it is composed of seven, more than 70% of cells. Fibrous crescent when the more than 70% of the crescent are of fibrous matrix, fibro, fibrocellular, when between, between both numbers, cellular more than 75 cells, fibrous more than 75 fibrous, fibrocellular when both uh, uh, fi cells and fibrin are between 25 and 75%. Also, they put a definition for adhesion, adhesion, and they uh, they define it as an area of isolated continuity of the extracellular material between tuft and capsule. So it is an area of isolated continuity of extracellular matrix material between the tuft and capsule. Before there was no definition. Fibrinoid necrosis. Also they put a definition for fibrinoid necrosis. It is fibrin associated with glomerular basement membrane disruption and or lysis of the mesangial matrix. This is the definition for fibrinoid necrosis. The recommendation also to remove the segmental and the global subdivisions, which we are talking about before. And they put some modification about the NIH activity and the chronicity scoring system Be, uh, to replace what we said before about the A and C and the A and C in the class before in the uh, as we said active and chronic lesions now they recommend using the activity and the chronicity indices by the national institute of health we should comment also if the interstitial inflammation uh, uh, and or fibrosis present or not these are the revised criteria we should know about the classification of lupus nephritis in renal biopsy now we'll talk about the activity and the chronicity indices, which are recommended to use. This is from the Kidigo 2021, the activity index and the chronicity score. And we are when we are uh, 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 reading a renal uh, biopsy uh, report for lupus patient, we should uh, have an activity index and a chronicity score. The activity scores, the activity index is from 0 to 24, and the chronicity score between 0 and 12. Of course, when we have a higher number, it is more with activity, or it is a higher number has more chronicity. What are the items that will count for these 24 in the activity index? Items here include endocrine hypercellularity, the score from 0 to 3, to have neutrophils and or cariorexes from 0 to 3, Fibrinoid necrosis, hyaline deposits in the form of wire loop or and or hyaline thrombi, crescent, crescent, but here it is active, so it is cellular or fibrocellular, and interstitial involvement in the form of interstitial inflammation. Each one of them have scored between 0 to 3, but there is two items, two items that the score will be multiplied by 2 due to its importance, which is the fibrinoid necrosis and the crescent presence this this number will be multiplied by two how to give the score 
when the, it is not present these items it is zero when it is present in less than 25 percent it is one it's between 25 to 50 percent two and more than 50 percent it is three and then we'll count the score and give the final score for the activity the chronicity score will include the glomerulosclerosis, not the hypercellularity here when we are chronic. Crescent here, uh, we are chronic, so it is fibrous crescent. The interstitium here, it is not inflammation, it is fibrosis. And the tubules, of course, are atrophied. So these are the items. Again, the score from 0 to 3, and the total count is from 0 to 12. Uh, this is how to count 0, 1, or 2, or 3. These activity and the chronicity score very important in the management and to determine the treatment to protocol. When I have a patient with high activity index and low chronicity score, so I can I augment the immunosuppression. So there is a high probability of getting benefit from immunosuppression. But if I have a patient with a high chronicity score, with severe interstitial fibrosis and atrophied, I should think I should think before giving or before intensifying the immunosuppression protocol. There are some histological findings that are not included in the activity and the chronicity score, including the lupus podocytopathy, collapsing lupus glomerulopathy, and vascular lesions, and arteriosclerosis, and vascular immune deposits, and TMA. All of these are not are not taken into account in this active and activity and the chronicity indices, but we should take it in account in the management protocol. In the immunofluorescence, as we said, the main or the dominant, the dominant immunoglobulin is the IgG, but also we can found deposition by IgA, IgM, and complement component, especially C1Q and C3. Usually, most of them are will be present, giving what is known as full house pattern. This is very, very important. The full house pattern is very characteristic of lupus nephritis. What is meant by full house that most of the immunoglobulins and the complement are will be positive or will be deposited in the glomerular IgG, IgA, IgM, C1Q, and C3. All of them will be deposited, giving what is called the full house pattern, very characteristic of lupus nephritis. What about the electron microscopy? The electron microscopy also will help us to determine the uh, area or the place of the immune deposits, either it is in the sub-epithelial or sub-endothelial uh, space. Also, uh, what is known, a term, what is known as fingerprinting, some fingerprinting, which is uh, uh, immune deposits have an organized structure, an organized uh, structure corresponding uh, uh, to the presence of microtubular or fibrillary structure in the deposits. Also, it is a common and characteristic feature. It's called fingerprinting, like the presence of microtubules or fibrillary structures in the deposits. Also, an, an, important, an important finding in the electron microscopy and also very characteristic, but it can present in other conditions like an interferon uh, drug uh, with the interferon use. It's called the tubular reticular inclusions. Tubular reticular inclusions can be present in HIV, can be present in lupus, and with interferon use. There's very characteristic uh, finding. They are tubular structures located in the endoplasmic reticulum of the, retic of the endothelial cells. So again, don't forget fingerprinting and tubular reticular inclusions in lupus nephritis. We can found also, as we said, the affection of lupus nephritis in the kidney is not just the glomerulus. The glomerulus is the main one, but also the interstitium. The interstitium can be affected and the blood vessels can be affected. The interstitium in the active disease, when there is active uh, nephritis, usually there is interstitial inflammation and tubulitis. But with more chronic disease, there is interstitial fibrosis and tubular atrophy. The true vasculitis, which is common in other rheumatological disease, uh, is usually rare in lupus nephritis, but we can find fibrinoid vascular necrosis or 
TMA, especially in severe forms or severe classes of lupus nephritis. Now let's look about uh, uh, let's look at these uh, renal biopsy photos. This is class three focal proliferative. As we see here, there is proliferation of the cells. There is proliferation of the endocapillary, so endocapillary hypercellularity. So it is focal proliferative. But to look here, it is in class four. There is diffuse hypercellularity. There is endocapillary hypercellularity which is there is increased number of cells and usually and it is present in more than 50 percent of the glomeruli so increased number of cells proliferation endocapillary cells not in the mesangium but it is in the endocapillary space what about your class five this is by methanamine silver stain showing the correct contouring double contouring some double contouring and to look here with high magnification at these at the spikes look for the spikes characteristic of membranous nephropathy there is spikes here and this is by immune uh, uh, this by electron microscopy as you see here this is are, are the electron density deposits mainly they are present in the sub epithelial space this is the urinary space they are usually mostly in the sub epithelial space characteristic of membranous nephropathy this is interstitial inflammation to look at here the, this is the interstitial there is increased number of inflammatory cells characteristic of interst uh, there is interstitial inflammation and as we said here this is vascular affection this is a vascular affection this this is a thrombus inside a glomerular capillary this is a thrombus inside the glomerular capillary to summarize what we have said when you have a patient suspecting to have a nephritis you should ask for serum creatinine for protein creatinine ratio and serology anti double strand and c3 to search for proteinuria and active urinary sediment dysmorphic rpcs red cell cost and proteinuria more than 0.5 gram if it is confirmed to renal biopsy to classify your patient or if there is decreased gfr and we repeat the test and there is no other cause no other cause to uh, uh, to clarify that uh, this deterioration of kidney function i should do renal biopsy what we should ask for again or an analysis to search for proteinuria and hematuria and should ask for album creatine ratio protein creatine ratio usually also we ask for uh, serum urea and creatinine and the esr is usually raised the crb crb is usually not raised this is a practical point crb is usually not raised in patient with active active relapse in lupus but when the crb will be elevated usually usually in cases with infection in lupus the crb usually will elevate in cases of infection not activity the immunological test as we said antinuclear antibody highly sensitive but less specific and anti double strand have a much higher specificity and usually c3 and c4 will be consumed and tc1q are much uh, uh, have a sensitivity and better specificity especially for uh, nephritis and if we suspected uh, antiphospholipid syndrome we should ask for anticardiolipid and lupus anticoagulant uh, antibodies and of course we should ask for renal ultrasound to know if there is obstruction or not and to clarify if it is uh, our kidney is uh, acute or chronic to uh, prepare the patient for renal biopsy renal biopsy is very important and as we said as i said every patient with lupus nephritis should have a, a renal biopsy and you should uh, do uh, immune histo uh, immune staining and the most common uh, uh, finding will be a full house pattern full house pattern is positive for all igm I, igg igm ig8 c3 and c1q and we can see other uh, affections in the form of TMA and lupus podocytopathy and this is the classification as we said minimal mesangial mesangial proliferative 
CD4 focal proliferative diffuse proliferative and membranous class 5, class 6 is the advanced sclerosis uh, class. This is our source and inshallah to continue in part to do the treatment in details. Thank you.